My name is Marcel Oltmann. I work for the Intel Open Source Technology Center. Um, and I will give you an update on what we have been doing to actually improve the Wi-Fi experience uh, on Linux. Um, before I get started, usual disclaimer, Linux is a trademark, Wi-Fi is a trademark, a bunch of logos are trademarks, etc., etc. So I don't have to annotate every single slide. I'm just getting that out of the way. Um, I found this XKCD uh, comic a while ago. And while I think it goes way too far, uh, maybe, um, but it has the right idea. Uh, most of the Wi-Fi configuration is getting really complicated and we are asking way too many stuff to a user that just wants to connect to a network. Be this a personal network at home, be this an enterprise network at your corporation or something else. You really want to make this as easy as possible. What has happened in the last probably 15 to 20 years is that we always started building things from the bottom up. Oh, we have this technology, we expose this technology one layer higher and another layer and another layer and all the technical details are sifting through to the user. And in a couple of operating systems, uh, you see this also that the UI has to fix up literally everything. Uh, and they have to understand the beacons that are sending, the, uh, they have to pass the beacons, they have to figure out what encryption is used, and so on and so forth. And really can't be, because the user only one needs to be asked what they actually uh, uh, can answer. Um, so um, we st oh, I started at Intel around 11 years ago with uh, Conman to actually get this working. We haven't really focused on the Wi-Fi part yet. But all these dialogues that you're going to see here are something that I just collected from the internet. And they're kind of crappy. I think if you look at the uh, top left and like uh, wireless encryption key, which key size, uh, where to put it, which index, most of the time I don't even know. Luckily, in the last uh, 15 years, the WEP has really uh, not been used anymore and we can ignore this. But then, oh, you want to connect to a hidden network, then you get all these weird options. Is an enterprise network, enterprise one, enterprise two. Does it really make a difference? Cannot the system figure this out for you, what it is? Um, and it goes further and further when you actually start at hoc mode, then you need to know about the MAC addresses of the device you connect to. I mean, like, who's going to ask these questions to a user? Why does a user want to configure this one? Um, when you actually come to the corporate networks, it gets even worse. So there's nothing on Linux where actually, oh, this is what you're going to get from your company. Here's the file, you install it, or here's the bundle, you install it. It has all the information in there. It's signed, uh, it's all done properly, and you connect to it. No. Mostly you get uh, instructions where you have to open this dialog, put this information there, load that certificate there, put that private key in there, click that box. And the bottom right is really like, oh, they had this all marked up then on the screenshots. Uh, just to get a student on a, on a, a Wi-Fi network for Europe. Uh, and it's getting way more complicated and they're putting way more options in there. I think at the end of the day, these dialogs can't really work. And we can't just have always tons of documentation. That's like Windows 95 style of thing. Um, the reason behind this is pretty much since uh, um, WSupplicant, the main thing that drives the Wi-Fi setup these days is this. It's a Swiss army knife of literally everything. They're doing a lot of awesome work. They're putting a lot of uh, new features in. It's in highly development, but it has fundamentally two problems. They don't make any decent releases, and, they ex uh, and when they don't make any releases, that doesn't get them distro, so new features and bug fixes, bug fixes don't get there, nobody picks them up, and you're stuck with something else. Also, they don't really want to expose any usable APIs. They pretty much give you the same technical details as you've gotten from the Linux kernel, as you've gotten from the hardware, and you have to figure out everything by yourself. But not always they give you all the details. Sometimes they swallow the details and you actually don't know what's happening. So in some cases, a state change in your Wi-Fi network, it doesn't tell you, it swallows this one, and you have to second guess if you want to start using it. And when you start second guessing what's your current status, if you're roaming or if you're not roaming, if you're connected to this access point, what's going to be happening, normally things go wrong. And a lot of cases, you're pretty much like uh, lost like Guybrush walking around and you can't really figure anything out. You have the great tool, but you actually really have no idea how to use it. Um, so about... Uh, until about four years ago, we thought we actually might can improve on this one and get WSupplicant to move more in the direction like being a real Wi-Fi management demon that actually manages your Wi-Fi network, remembers things, does things set up, actually solves all the hard problems for you. Um, sadly, the story is pretty much, they don't really want this. It wants to stay this uh, toolbox of things to test, to uh, start new specifications, test new specifications, get things working on new specifications, put in new code, uh, do some vendor testing um, and so on and so forth. Okay, awesome, that's great. But pretty much everything running Linux relies on WSupplicant and everybody has to put their own magic on top of this one. They have to hack around their own features. They have to actually patch these things over and over again. Um, and the result is that pretty much every company provides with their hardware 
our own version W supplicant. Every operating system provides their own version. Um, the only thing, if you use the Linux desktop, they're stuck with what kind of upstream is doing. It's an older version because no distro is really doing all the effort actually getting this working. So think about WP3 support. Or we want actually more secure Wi-Fi. Have you seen any distro supporting this one yet? W Supplicant has support for it, but nobody's actually putting the work and actually put this in into the distros. Um, and that's really the fundamental problem that we're actually trying to get after. So um, at some point around four years ago, we realized we actually have to start from scratch. We have to use what the Linux kernel is offering, maybe fix some of this one. I will get to this in a second. Um, but uh, then start on what the kernel is giving us and actually throw W Supplicant out and redo this how we would have done this with uh, Bluetooth, how we've done this with NFC, how we've done with this telephony and everything else. So IWD, iNet Wireless Daemon, it will manage all your Wi-Fi networks. It will do everything for you. It will only ask you for things that it can't answer, like what's your passphrase uh, or what Wi-Fi do you want to connect to. So you can scan with it, you can connect, and you actually get asked for the passwords. So it does everything. It remembers everything. So this is the most important part. You don't have to reprogram it every time you start it. If you connect it to a network, it, you start it next time around, it will have remembered it. And before you actually have anything done, it will probably already have connected to it because it has scanned for it, it found it, and you're done. So you don't have to do anything else. If you already remember it and have all your credentials stored, you don't have to ask the UI anymore. So pretty much when GNOME is started, everything is already set up. Um, one interesting thing is it actually is the only entity that starts scanning on your Wi-Fi card. W Supplicant has the fun fact that it scans. It has to scan because that's how Wi-Fi works. You have to find your beacons, you have to find your access points. Um, but if you want to do anything else, the higher layers also had to scan. So your daemon, network manager, conman, et cetera, scans. And then you ended up that the UI sometimes had to scan as well because it needed to figure out something else. So three entities in your system starting to scan and utilizing actually your bandwidth of your radio. That means you will have uh, outages, you will have actually overlapping, and you don't really utilize the card as good as you can. So you want to put the scanning all at the level that where someone can make an intelligent decision when to scan, and especially on which channels to scan. So if you actually, for example, want to roam uh, to another network and you know where this network is, you can do a quick scan on that uh, band and just find it. If you have to switch between 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, if you have to scan a whole 5 gigahertz network to find your access point again, that takes time. That's time you can't be on the actual channel transmitting data. You see interrupts and sometimes access points just disconnect you. So that's something you really have to do centralized. Um, fast roaming was once really important because you get more access, you uh, get Wi-Fi mesh networks, you get everything else. You have more access points at home. The areas are getting larger. You want to be able to walk around and roam really quickly and reliable. And you can actually do this in a lot of cases by just asking the access point, what are my neighbors? You don't have to do anything else. Just tell me if I have a neighbor and tell me if my signal is getting too weak then I tell me where to roam on. And you just follow this one. As a client, you can be really sitting there and relaxing if you're a good access point. Um, we don't care about anything else than Linux. I mean, focusing on how you have to run this on an Apple device, on Windows, on, uh, uh, on FreeBSD, I think it's, it's nice, it's great, it's awesome, but fundamentally we have to solve our own problems, so let's uh, solve our problems first. Um, we wanted to make the code readable, so you actually can audit it and figure this out. Um, w supplicant is not a readable code. Before you find the entities that actually do something, you have jumped through the six layers of indirection before you find something. Um, it's historical. I understand why it's there, but at some point you have to say, okay, either clean this up or live with this mess forever. And you only have like two people in the world that probably know that code. Uh, everybody else is spending an hour to figure out what this thing is doing. Um, interesting when you do actually readable code is that you actually start uh, separating this in small blocks and uh, doing the beacon processing in a separate one. You can put right a unit test for this one and you actually ensure really easily that it's still keep doing the right thing. Um, you can also nicely add, if you do everything in one box, you can really add nice end-to-end uh, -end testing. So you can just put this in a simulator, test this, and you ensure that your authentication with your network still work. Um, when it comes to actually the security, we wanted to separate this into pieces and not mix this together in one big thing. So we can actually have the EAP uh, separated out, the EAP over LAN separated out, and also the four-way handshake separated out. So we actually can reuse this and utilize this properly. And you will see this later on why this was needed to be done. Um, as mentioned in the first slide, uh, the focus on the DBus API that we're exposing to use this is really user-centric. It's from the UI, what the UI needs, or what the user needs to do, and not what we actually want to do. If you want to do this, you can have some diagnostic APIs, but fundamentally focus on that the user gets uh, access to the Wi-Fi networks. So with this one, um, we have pretty much everything put into an agent. You only get asked when you actually need the information. You don't have to provide them up front. A lot of cases you needed to provide the information up front. So you need to know, oh, what kind of network is this? You don't know up front. 
Um, sometimes some of the information you know why you connected to it and figured something else. Uh, so ask at the right point, but give the user the ability to actually then enter the information. For example, the difference between uh, WP1 and WP2, the most users don't really care. Pick the most strong encryption and you start using it. Don't ask the user which encryption they want to use. Um, same as when you actually connect an enterprise network. If you're missing something like the uh, private key, then ask them for the private key when you actually need it. Don't ask this information all up front and decrypt all the certificates. Same as some identity information or domain names or something else. Ask them when you need them. Um, with all this crypto, we actually didn't say we want to use OpenSSL and GNU TLS. Personally, these libraries are huge. We want to run this on small embedded systems. They are also blocking in a lot of cases. That means I have to either use threading or hack around this really heavily. So we actually said, okay, don't use this. We're going to use the kernel crypto. The kernel exposes the crypto interfaces really nicely, and you can use them so you have AS available, ECDH, and so on and so forth. Um, for an enterprise side, you've seen the dialogues. We don't really want you to enter these dialogues. That's like we had get a, get a config file that has this all set up let this auto-generate, have it signed so it's actually secure, you know you actually got this from the source, you have it, put it in your file system and everything will just gonna work. And I will show you an example on this one later on. Um, Wi-Fi simple configuration, so pretty much press a button on your access point and uh, the Wi-Fi will connect to it and figure out all the everything. So the, the zero configuration setup. If you wanna do this really working with WSupplicant, you kinda can, and we got like 90% of this one done in Conman, but it never really worked 100%. It's complicated, it's convoluted, uh, and it's just fundamentally broken because you don't get all the right information at the right time. Uh, with IWD, that actually works perfectly. So you can press your button on your access point, you press uh, start WPS on your uh, UI, you're connected, works really nicely. Um, access point mode support had to come as well because that's what people, a lot of people use for tethering, et cetera, so that we have as well. So this is something that's four years later, we have all of this one available. Um, we started four years ago, uh, ago but only uh, beginning of this year we started actually making releases. If you don't make any releases, your product, or your product doesn't really exist. It's, it's not there. It's, uh, make releases so distros can start integrating this. So beginning of the year we had the confidence so we can actually start driving this towards. Um, so February 10th was the first release. You could connect to an open network, you can connect to personal networks, and you could WPS. So that was already pretty much uh, really good for us to actually get going. And we got this into Arch Linux and some other distros. And they happily tried this out. Um, in May, we finally got fixed one of the fundamental problems that were always bugging us. So the whole the uh, four-way exchange, the key exchange, happens over an Ethernet port. The problem is that everything else happens over Netlink. Uh, the kernel schedules your Ethernet port packet delivery and your Netlink packet delivery at random. So while they're on the wire, they arrive in, uh, in sequence when you actually get to the, the process that processes them, they might have actually reordered them. So generally this is not a problem, but some of these information with newer technologies about uh, on how to set up WP3 and so on and so forth, they need information from the management frames that only arrive over Netlink 802.11, and they need information from the eAP that only arrives over Ethernet port. So we finally got the feature into the Linux kernel where we actually can say, look, don't send the Ethernet pack, uh, the, Ether, uh, the eAP packets over the Ethernet port, send them over, encapsulate it over Netlink, so we actually have them in sequence as they arrive on the air. And that's really important to fix a lot of race conditions that a lot of uh, stacks have hacked around. So they kept the packet waiting, they hope that the other one arrives, and maybe it arrives, maybe it doesn't arrive, maybe it doesn't arrive in the right order, then you can't uh, uh, assign it properly anymore. So this is all fixed now, so if you have properly supported hardware that actually does this, they arrive in sequence and you don't have any race conditions anymore, so you don't have any um, spontaneous disconnects or you can't connect uh, errors and so on and so forth. Um, tiny feature, completely invisible to everybody, but really important to actually improve this. Um, in June, we actually got hidden networks working. So hidden networks is, isn't a concept of Wi-Fi. That's an invention from Cisco. Um, and it's so painful that you pretty much tell everybody not to use a hidden network because it actually consumes more power. Um, I think we worked it out as good as we can when we have a hidden network, so we only scan for the hidden network, so we only reveal the uh, SSIDs of the hidden network. Because the problem is with the hidden network, and uh, you will actually reveal your hidden network SSID more than you actually protect it from your client. So stores like when you walk into a uh, Macy's or something else, they can actually track you on, on your home networks and they can uh, find you next time around. So you rather not connect to hidden networks if you uh, value your privacy. Um, one month later, we got ad hoc networks working. Initially, we said we're never gonna do ad hoc, ad hoc networks because it's kind of old technology, no one needs it. 
Um, it came out of the restructuring of some of the security code and some of the handling of the handshake that we actually pretty much got the ad hoc support for free with full uh, uh, PSK encryption. Then we put access point mode in there. On August, we finally got the WP3 support working underneath, so we actually don't see a difference connecting to w uh, WPA1, WP2, or WP3 network. We handle all the difference for you. We handle all the uh, pass key transitions and so on and so forth. Um, and we started keeping and growing the list of enterprise EM methods so we actually can uh, uh, talk to uh, enterprise networks. Um, in September, a month ago, um, that was the big change because we were already um, starting to ready get to uh, drive towards 1.0. We split uh, the uh, API into different modes. So we broke a little bit of the API when we added a station mode, ad hoc mode, access point mode. So they were really nicely separated. So you can actually really switch the mode of your card and say, look, you're operating access point mode, you're operating station mode, no, you're operating ad hoc mode. So it's really clean and doesn't try to interleave or mix this. That also means scan results, et cetera, are filtered appropriately in what mode you're in. Um, more EAP, uh, methods for enterprise. And we also got the fast transitioning for roaming uh, with WP3 finally working. Uh, beginning of this month. And uh, about a couple of days ago, I did another release. Um, so we don't go from 0 0.9 to 1.0. We go to 0 0.10 until we have everything ready. Um, we have an Ethernet authentication daemon now as well. You can do the same on Ethernet. I will get to this one. And finally, this is the first version that builds with uh, an external uh, ELL. ELL is an embedded Linux library. It's a replacement for glib, but really smaller and more dedicated for actually if you want to implement a daemon. Um, we had this available for like six years now. We have building releases with this one, but until now it was always baked into the source code of IWD so we actually can easily deploy this. Now we have the choice, use the built-in internal one or use uh, compile it in an external one. Some distros want actually really after that. Like we don't want to actually have library built into the source code of a daemon. We want to actually ship the library separately so we can do security updates separately. Well understood concept, but finally we actually made this work as well. So we are really driving towards to getting this to 1.0. Um, with that all said, the architecture looks uh, probably more of people have seen this uh, picture before. But w, uh, w supplicant on the left side is, is the beast. It supports everything in the kitchen sink. It has tons and tons of options. Um, we picked one when we actually did Conman. Uh, we used the version 2 of the Dbus API. It probably needs a version 3 and a version 4 before this is any usable for anybody. Uh, we picked uh, LibNL and Netlink 802.11, uh, Config 802.11, and then either full Mac or soft Mac. But they all had support for all the stuff on the right side as well, for Mac OS and everything else. Um, the really bad part is that we actually write this whole G supplicant to actually make the Dbus API digestible and usable and fix all the issues around it. So you have this whole layer that actually has to do another thing that you would think, oh, why would I have to do this? It's way too much work. Um, with uh, IWD, we actually slimmed this down. It's like we only focus on Netlink 8 to 11, um, full Mac or soft Mac cards. We use the AFARC interface for the ciphers and we use the key control for asymmetric uh, cryptography in the kernel. So the only thing we really need on a user space side is TLS records. So you need the TLS framing and you need the PEM format uh, to uh, unpack your certificates. Everything else is handled by the kernel. Then you let uh, ELL handle things like mainlist, Dbus, uh, Netlink. It's all baked natively into ELL, nicely asynchronously in a, uh, in a single uh, uh, process. And then you have IWD and then you just have your Dbus interface and then you can put Conman, Network Manager, put whatever you want on top of it. Um, the nice thing that we actually separated this all out and did this cleanly from a UI point of view is that previously, the only way to actually use WSuperCAN, we actually put a wrap around it. You have to wrap this whole completely because it, you can't have two applications using it. You can't have two applications accessing it. Everything goes wrong. States are not properly shared. You mess around the other one. If you just want to have uh, like an RSSI reading of your network, you pretty much scan again, then you trigger another scan, and so on and so forth. So you actually had this whole wrapping around it and that means everybody had to go through Conman to actually get something simple done, like, oh, I want to display the uh, connected Wi-Fi network and the RSSI level or the signal strength level. Huge effort that you had to do. Um, while with IWD, you don't. We have separate uh, things that are separate, are really separated out. So if you want to have answer passphrase uh, request, you register an agent, and that then you get, oh, I need the identity, I need the passphrase, I need uh, that key, I need that extra information that you domain. Or you just want to display your network name and the RSSI icon in your um, status bar, you register an agent for this one that actually just get you this information, only get you when they change and you're connected to it. Or you actually want to scan for something, then you use a tool like Conman, Network Manager, IW Control to actually say, look, I want to scan, I want to find the network, do this. Can we all separate it out? So you don't actually have to put everything into the whole UI. You can separate this out really nicely and they can run, run all at the same time and they don't uh, mess with, with each other. 
Um, the integration with Conman was really early, but it kind of stalled since we actually focused on getting most of the stuff for IW done, so that needs a little bit of love, especially for the scanning features. But fundamentally, you can actually use uh, Conman with IW as well. Um, we shifted the focus to actually see if we can get this in more distributions. And the reality of the fact is that uh, most Linux distributions ship with Network Manager by default. So we put a lot of work in actually fixing, changing Network Manager to actually adapt to the new principle that you don't have to handle all of the Wi-Fi details. We handle them all for you. That code is all obsolete that you have there. Let us handle things. So we have this fully working for personal networks now. The nice thing is once you put the level down and actually so all the details are solved by a daemon below, WP3 support is there. So if you have Network Manager with IWD, you get the support for free and you have all the setup that you need. Um, we have also working enterprise network setup uh, as Network Manager 1.14. That's in there as well. And we keep improving this one. So you see patches coming in, fixes coming in, and we keep actually working on this one that the next version of Network Manager will actually fully support IWD. And hopefully by that point, IWD is 1.0 and you get it in the distros. I think Fedora has it in there. Arch has it in there. Uh, Debian has it in there. A uh, bunch of others, I don't even know. Who the, a lot of distros have toyed with this one and uh, packaged it. So I think you can get a recent version of Network Manager and IWD just by uh, installing it from your distro. We have a prototype for Chrome OS. That will work as well. Um, that one is really rough, and we haven't published this one yet. Because Chrome OS has the really nasty thing that a lot of details of the Wi-Fi stuff leaks into your Chrome browser. So they're fixing a lot of things up on the really high level. So we need a lot of redesigning and restructuring there to actually push things back down where they're supposed to be. So that's still uh, work ongoing. We have a version where in, uh, Intel's clear Linux, we have Network Manager and IWD in there, works really well. And the internal, uh, internal command line client IW control is also really nice to just uh, use uh, for uh, your connections. Um, on the way, we actually fixed a lot of things. Um, the kernel wasn't perfect. That's the problem with the kernel interface where you only have a single user. That single user uses the kernel interface in a certain way and they never figure out that certain things are actually going to be missing. Hot plug, for example, was never really fully supported because WSupplicant doesn't do any hot plug. Someone else has to figure out the hot plug and then tell it where the cards are. We didn't want this. We, we wanted to tell us where the cards are. Um, certain features didn't work as documented, so, but since WSupplicant used them differently, nobody noticed. Um, you had missing cleanups. So the attribute socket owner, for example, when you start a scan and then WSupplicant dies, the card still keeps scanning. Or you, in the process of connecting to network, the card keeps on connecting. And the next time you're around, what are you going to do? How are you going to reset the whole thing? You power everything down, or what are you going to do? So um, generally, WSupplicant shouldn't die. Then, then uh, IWD shouldn't die. But things happen. You really want that the kernel cleans after you. They have access to the radio resources. They know when you're gone. Just stop the transaction that you're doing. If you do like a scan on 5 gigahertz, that takes a while. Just stop it. You don't need to do it anymore. Um, so we fixed this with a lot of things where you can actually finally say if the process that actually triggered it dies, the transaction gets dropped. Um, I mentioned EAP over Netlink H11, really important. We put the RSSI triggers uh, into a uh, kernel interface because a lot of hardware supports them actually. So you really only wake up when the RSS changes to a certain threshold and then you can update your UI and say, look, actually the signal strength changed. Um, there are a bunch of bugs with the clear text leaks of PTK rekeying because rekeying never really worked. Everybody ignored this. I think so we have finally fixed this to a level where um, the, ha the hardware has to declare if they support this properly or not. And we can work around this uh, if needed. Um, for the simulator, HWSIM, we actually put a lot of extra work in uh, uh, making that more usable so you have more end-to-end uh, -end testing. Um, I think besides one or two minor patches that are still on the pipeline, all of this one has been now uh, upstreamed. Um, so if you have a recent kernel, you actually have all these fixes. Um, one thing that we had to do, uh, and nobody did before, is kind of funny, we actually wanted to see what's going on between the daemon and the kernel. And for that one, we built IWMON. It's a tracing utility that actually takes the input from the netlink and AF packet and the de just decodes it. So you don't have to put your debugging into IWD or tracing. You just take it from the kernel and say, look, what packets are you actually exchanging? And the fun thing, then you can figure out some things that actually went wrong. So obviously, we can send a message. Uh, the kernel says not supported or a uh, key is not available. It keeps sending it, key's not available. Look, I told you the key's not available, why you keep sending this to me? And these kind of things. And you then easily see where things go wrong and where um, things are missing. Um, so what we have right now is station mode, access point mode, and ad hoc mode. Um, 
But we also actually put all the SSID grouping one level down. So network managers have to do it anymore. We actually do this all for it. We handle the hidden IDs. We handle the full uh, four-way handshake properly. We do pre-authentication if uh, available. We do fast transitioning. So really, we ask the access point, do you want us to go to a different access point? Do you have a neighbor access point? And we just switch to it. It tells us where it is. It's so fast, it's unbelievable. It's really nice. We manage the radio resources properly. And we also authenticate with access points like, look, did you really want to disconnect us? So can you confirm that you want to disconnect us so you can't actually have anything um, sneaking in and trying to uh, forcefully disconnect you? Um, the enterprise support is growing. So we have this really nicely working. The EAP methods are, are there. Um, we have most EAP methods. There are a few ones missing, a few proprietary ones, but uh, pretty much everybody uses EAP TLS uh, or EAP PAP. Um, so all of this one is there. All of this one is tested. They all have end-to-end -end tests. They all have a unit tests. So this is pretty much uh, working nicely. The only minor caveat is that the asymmetric key patches that we need to do this are not yet upstream. Uh, James Morris took them into the security tree, so hopefully they make it into 4.20, 5.0 once uh, James is back from the conference and sends a pull request to lenders. Um, the interesting part with these ones is since they're in the kernel, they integrate with the TPM. So you can actually have your setup uh, in a way that your key that the company provisions for you is actually in your TPM. So it's a security that you really want because if, if someone, uh, um, the, the keys and everything else is really not on your system, you know, they're in your hardware and you can really utilize them. I'm trying to get this working with uh, OpenSSL, GNU TLS and all these engine support and trousers and God knows what you actually have to do there. It's really messy. We have this in, it's in there for TPM1 and I think hopefully we get this in there as also for TPM2 so we actually have this nicely working with the key control API and you can actually access the TPM uh, properly. And then WP, uh, IWD can just uh, make use of it if it's available. Um, if you, um, as I said, we don't actually have APIs for the enterprise. Um, we do enterprise provisioning based on a file. Um, doing this with this whole UI setup, it will probably stay around for a long time and the network manager plugin for IWD will work around this. But our vision is that you actually get a simple file from the uh, administrator or something you can download easily that is also signed. Uh, uh, where you actually have all your certificates in there and listed, and then you actually just put it in. Uh, IWD uh, recognizes it, and then your network is available immediately. Doing this all with the UI setup, it's really complicated, and the idea of that, you, oh, I want to ch exchange this one certificate to another one, but I want to keep every other option the same, that's not really how this works. I mean, if your certificate is expired, most cases you have to also change the CA uh, for this one, or the interim CA that they have for this one, or maybe the identity changed of something else. This is something you make mistakes, fine, you want to correct them in the UI, but in the reality, the admin or the uh, 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 company setup system have to actually give this information. So it's pretty much as simple as this. You get a small ini file and you put this in and then you can actually have extra options. If you leave something out or the company decides to leave something out, we will ask the user for it. For example, the, uh, the passphrase for the private key, uh, which is asked from the user. If you put it in there, it will be used and so on and so forth. For example, if the identity is missing or anything else. Um, they follow pretty much what the uh, a standard does, that's all documented, um, and we have tons of examples on this one. Um, but I think that's how this has to happen. Um, for the uh, user-facing API, so what the UI can actually use, it actually is also pretty simple. Um, this is the um, command list for the IW control utility. It's pretty much one-to-one -one mapping to the Dbus APIs. So you get your list of adapters. That's your physical cards that in the system you can list them. Um, it's not really much useful except you can get the name because we use the, the UDF database to actually match the UIDs to the name so you get some friendly name on this one. You can either start an ad hoc network or see if you're, it's already started and working if you want to use ad hoc network. As I said, this is more like was an exercise in uh, uh, getting the cryptography uh, done properly. Uh, access point is more interesting. You want to start your card as access point. Uh, you start or stop it. That's all you want to do. We don't support uh, unencrypted uh, open network uh, access points because I don't think this is pretty much useful. Um, when it comes to actually station mode, this becomes more interesting. So you have the devices API, that is really your interface. Um, so you can list them and you can change properties on them. One property would be the mode, change the ad hoc mode, access point mode, or uh, station mode. By default, they come all in station mode like it is with Linux. Um, with your station command, you can just list your stations and then you see what stations you're gonna have. Uh, and then you uh, can just connect to a network or you can connect to a hidden one. So we explicitly separated connect to a network from a connect to a hidden network because the connect to a hidden network needs special operations. And so this is clearly uh, separated. But the only thing you really have to give it is the network name. It will figure out everything else by itself. So 
someone says you oh, my SSID XYZ, and then you do my XYZ. And if it's encrypted, then it will ask you, OK, I found your network now here. It's uh, WPA encrypted. Uh, I need a passphrase, so the user gets asked a passphrase. You can disconnect it, then it gets off the auto-connect list, um, or you can actually just uh, scan for it, and then you get the list of scan networks, and it will just give you the information. Um, that's all you're going to have from an API when you actually, for example, network when you use to connect to your networks. The other one is the known networks, the networks that we actually remember. You can list them, and you can forget them. If you're accidentally connected to one, what you're going to forget, you get automatically disconnected. So it's not like you have to disconnect first and forget. We do this for you. And then you have your automatic Wi-Fi configuration. It's pretty much it's available, fine. And then you can uh, figure out if you want to do push button, which is the most, what most people do. Or if uh, the access point provides a pin, then you actually start or use the pin or generate a pin. And if you feel like, uh, I don't really want to go anywhere, you can just cancel it also on the way through. OK. Um, I think I'm going to move the demo to the end, since it's more interesting what's coming next. So we have a list of technical things that are missing. None of these ones will probably stop us from doing a 1.0 release uh, by the end of the year. Um, but there are a few things that needs to be done. There, there's fundamental group ciphers and pairwise ciphers, so we're actually going to fix that. We want to do a lot of the key caching um, that has to happen. The TDLS support and DLS support, I don't know. If we get to P2P setup, we're actually probably going to do this. Uh, more interesting is the opportunistic wireless encryption. That's pretty much if you have an open network and the access point support it. You don't get any authentication, but you can encrypt it. So you can connect an open network and the link is encrypted so nobody can sniff it, um, but you actually don't have any man-in-the-middle protection. So I think that's a big advantage. Um, the Wi-Fi, uh, the zero-conf setup uh, for simple configuration has a new version. Now it's called Device Provisioning Protocol, DPP. Um, I don't think we get this done for 1.0, but I think this follow really quickly afterwards. We actually also have support for this one. And then a P2P is, uh, it's interesting. We have, I think, 60% of the setup done, but there's a couple of things still missing we need to do. So I think this will have to wait until we, uh, we are done with uh, 1.0. And there's a couple of EAP methods. Um, I don't think we're actually going to do them, but uh, maybe someone else wants to put them in. We have to see that. Um, but as I said, nothing of this one is really stopping us from doing a 1.0. Um, we have two uh, big to-do items to actually get sorted out. And one is the actually embedded Linux API review. So we are happy with that API. So we can do an ELL 1.0 release at the same time you do an IWD 1.0 release. And then we want to have uh, another review of uh, the IWD bus APIs, because once we declare them stable, uh, Network Manager is really relying on this one, or you make everybody else rely on this one. So we can't really easily break them anymore. So that's the next two big things that has to happen before we uh, call this 1.0. Um, there's one other thing that we have been working on. I think I mentioned this earlier. Um, we also want to do this for the Ethernet. So while IWD is primarily focused on Wi-Fi, in a corporate setup, uh, I think more and more corporations locking down the Ethernet ports. And where you end up, I borrowed this from Cisco, um, was the only nice diagram that I could find about this that is not too technical is that you actually have to authenticate first via the EAP Ether or EAP Pol Ethernet port, and then everything else is opened up. It's a really simple system. Um, it can do a lot more, um, but that's the pretty much what most companies are doing. Okay, the Ethernet port is blocked. You have to authenticate yourself um, and go on. The interesting thing is it's pretty much just EAP. Um, but if you actually use WSuplicant to do this, it turns your Ethernet card into a fake um, access point and then runs run station mode. So you get all of these log messages and all this weird stuff, and nothing really you can decipher if anything goes wrong. Um, in addition, you have to always start it manually. So there's no automatic thing that actually text is this an uh, EAP enabled uh, or 802.1x uh, enabled uh, Ethernet port. Um, so we had EAD for it, Ethernet Authentication Demon. You realize I like three uh, letter acronyms. They're kind of nice as a process name. Um, it's a single demon that enumerates all your Ethernet cards and does uh, auto-detection of 1x on that one. So it figures out, OK, do I need to run 1x, yes or no, and then we'll enable it. I use the same EAP structure from IWD, so that code is shared. Again, with that one, it will integrate with TPM as well, if you have that set up. It's super tiny and lightweight. Um, what's currently work in process is getting the agent interface ready, so if you're missing credential parts like identity, et cetera, the user just gets asked for it. On. We need an additional one as well, because most networks don't identify themselves. So you have multiple credentials. So you have credentials for Google, you have credentials for Intel. You have to actually decide, OK, which ones are these? Um, funny enough, most of the ports don't actually identify themselves, so you actually have to guess. 
And obviously, you don't want to apply all credentials, so we, re we don't want to reveal that actually support one or the other. And it gets a really debus, uh, simple debus API so that you actually can see, oh, I'm on an Ethernet card that is authenticated now, so I don't do anything else. The initial version is already part of, uh, of IWD. Uh, for simplicity, for now, we stuck it into the IWD source code. Um, it has configure options, so you can just only uh, build IWD with uh, only shipping EAD. It's all documented uh, for the uh, autoconf stuff. Uh, and with this one, you can then easily uh, start testing this on your corporate network, and you actually had some problems. And actually, I really like to get feedback on this one, where this works on a corporate network or not, because we had a lot of fun with uh, our own corporate network, where certain things are working a little bit differently uh, that you would expect when you rate the standard. Um, but we actually have this nicely working, and uh, we can use this to authenticate our Ethernet ports. Um, since I'm probably only five minutes I've left, um, Freenode ISC for IWD, Freenode ISC for ELL, that's where most communication happens. Uh, um, the mailing list is, uh, I should have put the mailing list as well, the mailing lists are there as well. Um, IWD has a kernel wiki, uh, happy to if anybody wants to actually document this or uh, put any information in there. There's a bunch of uh, wikis for the different distros. I think the Arch wiki for IWD is pretty good if you want to get started. Um, and um, the Git trees have the most information and documentation in them as well, so it's easy to browse. Um, I was going to do the demo, but I'm probably opening this first uh, for questions. Do you have any questions? All right. Yes, please. Uh, so the question is if uh, we have plans to uh, extend to authentic role. Yes. Not any immediate time. We have a bunch of things to do first, but yes, we also want to do the other side so we can also do an access point. I think, you know, there was one. So the question is if this would become the central point for the uh, um, configuration of the Ethernet. So um, IWD will only manage Wi-Fi cards. EAD will only manage Ethernet cards. Um, they will manage these cards separately. But then what you're going to do with them uh, is up to one layer up. So if you want to do any routing on that one, et cetera. Um, I have to say, our plan is actually to put DHCP into these daemons. So do all the IP configuration inside the daemons as an optional part. That is actually needed in a certain situations because uh, for Wi-Fi this is needed, for example, the Tokyo subway situation. The train comes into the subway, you have like around a second or two to actually get your network up, get your data. You can't wait until some other uh, system actually configures you, selects Wi-Fi uh, as the default and so on and so forth. You actually need to get this all done and you get the IP addresses over management frames from your Wi-Fi access point. Uh, so you need to actually do the whole setup all by yourself. Um, that's something we're still working on to actually separate this nicely. But then, uh, do you want to route over Wi-Fi or do you want to route over Ethernet? That's for someone else to figure out. We just want to make the port available and trigger the authentication or re-authentication. I hope that answers your question. Um, over there, I think. I'm not sure, but can IWD be used without Dbus? No. So the question is, if, can IWD be used without Dbus? The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> okay. At some point, you have to be realistic how the world looks like right now. Uh, Dbus is not that bad. We're shipping our own Dbus library. We don't use the default implementation. Uh, some guys from Red Hat are working on Dbus broker that is a lot uh, slimmer and tinier. I mean, build your own IPC or use Dbus. Yes, you could. And you can probably change IWD to actually extract this out because this is not really that complicated. There's not that much API. But we have to make a choice at some point. We have to say, okay, we have to use Dbus for this one. Uh, I would rather look in optimizing Dbus than actually trying to figure out to get Dbus out of IWD. Yes, please. Okay, so the question is, is this is a full access point mode? At this point in time, no. We will get there because we, um, the reality is we see that we also need to do something for the uh, um, routers and real access points of homes there for some replacement. Because many of the uh, router manufacturers actually using WSupplicant have tons and tons of problems. We are not there yet. 
the team is like five people, so we have to have set the priorities. But the plan is to actually get this whole thing set up properly, because if you're on the access point and you're actually a really good access point, you can do a lot of things by steering your clients into the right direction and optimizing your bandwidth on your network. Um, we need to do this. It will happen, but not this year. There's another one over there. It can't be used as a replacement for host APD right now. It will eventually. It's a personal access point like tethering, for example. You switch, for example, you have an Ethernet connection and you want your phone to share it with. Um, I don't know this for sure, but I heard someone actually build it on it. So, um, I hope so. Another question? Okay, I think you were first. Have you looked at the supporting either 211X mesh point? Uh, have we uh, looked at supporting the uh, mesh, the Wi-Fi mesh, um, or oh, uh, 11S, uh, 11S mesh? Um, we don't have this on the roadmap for this year, but I had a discussion with someone about uh, a month ago. I think we need to do this as well. Contributions are more than welcome. Um, we can't do this right now. Uh, it's completely possible to do this really quickly because I think all the crypto, because we did WP3, the SAE part, so all the crypto support should be already in there for handling this. So I think you just need to actually manage the mesh nodes. So contributions are welcome, not this year, sorry. There was another one over there. Uh, so the, uh, the question is what, uh, what interface we're going to use to access the crypto. So it's AFALC. So you can access to the ciphers and hashes, etc. Pretty simple. Um, so if they're hardware optimized, you will use the hardware. We don't do that much. That really makes a performance difference. Uh, for the astrometric crypto, we use key control. So, key con so you actually, uh, the key control uh, kernel subsystem actually allows you to build uh, complete key rings. And uh, it allows to use asymmetric uh, uh, certificates. Uh, so you can actually build your whole CA inside the kernel, and then there are provisions that keyrings actually only allow extension of the keyrings if you uh, validate against an existing one. So this is whole build, and then you have operations for assign, verify, encrypt, and decrypt. And then the kernel will decide if this is a, a certificate that is in a TPM or not in a TPM, or if you have to load it before, etc. So it's pretty much a CA inside the kernel. Any other questions? Oh, please. Yes, we have. Um, so system network deintegration, um, first of all, it will just gonna work because it will eventually signal the interfaces up and if you've configured it, it will just start DHCP and it will just run. Um, there's a little bit of caveat on this one when you actually wanna have your favorite network name and the kernel decided uh, that's WLAN zero, but you like the really weird naming of someone else. Um, we are faster than UDEF can rename it and then you get blocked. So uh, when IW starts bringing the interfaces up, an interface up that is up cannot be renamed anymore. So that kind of thing is bunkers. Um, I don't know how to fix it. We looked at it to fix it. I have no idea. So you don't get your fancy shiny network names if the system network wants to rename your link. But otherwise it just works. Um, it could do more if we would finally agree on some extensions where we actually, for example, can uh, annotate the system network deconfig files with the SSID. So we say, oh, look, we want to run uh, this DHCP IP6 only on this SSID on the other one. Currently, uh, system network is unaware of what network you're connected to. For that one, they have to learn the annotated. I had a couple of proposals to Leonard and the others, but uh, it kind of calmed down on this one. They didn't want to do this. So, look, we need to annotate you. We have to tell you what currently network you're connected on because the interface is not going to change. There's still work to do. But we're going to take DHCP away from them. So, all good. Any other questions? Because I'm running signal that out of time. Sorry that I can't do the demo. I think I talked too much. If you have any other questions or want to see a short demo, then just catch me afterwards. Thank you very much.